We're continuing tonight in the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. That is, that you see, you're given that miracles are like an index to Christ's character and God's purpose and how He works. <coughs> I want to take a moment to uh, to attempt to define a miracle. I want to try to do this each time. <clears throat> the miracle is the imposition of God's will into the course of nature. Mm -hmm. Just like he thrusts himself into the mm -hmm. suspends nature. <laughs> that's that's what a sort of miracle is. Yeah. It's something that only God can do. <clears throat> there are no miracles in heaven. Mm -hmm. Miracles are for the domain of nature, the domain of the created. Mm -hmm. This is just normal in the in the glory. So there will not be miracles in the glory world because there's not going to be a suspending of anything. It's just going to be an eternal order. So what in another point of view, a miracle is like an exposure to eternal power and eternal eternal uh, sufficiency. Amen. Like you're exposed to it. There are no limitations with God mm -hmm. at all. So that we want that to speak to us as we go through these miracles that kindle hope and faith in your heart. Jesus one time, or God one time asked Abraham, is anything too hard for God? <laughs> well, theologically it's easy to say, well, of course not. <laughs> when you're in the pit, that's another matter. But that's what you want to be able to do, is when you're in the pit, to be able to answer that question appropriately. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to deal with the raising of the widow of Nain's son. <clears throat> now this is only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. The other Gospel writers did not record it. <clears throat> But it's a very, a very tender and unique miracle. It's found in Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 11 through 17. <clears throat> it came to pass the day after that he went into the city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not! And he came and touched the bier, or we would say coffin. Mm -hmm. And they that bear him stood still. Mm -hmm. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. <clears throat> and he that was dead sat up mm -hmm. and began to speak. <clears throat> and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. <clears throat> now you certainly do learn about the discipline of the Holy Spirit there, and those accounts like that. Such a grand event compressed into seven verses? Well, this could write a book about that. You could only imagine how much could be said. But the reason isn't that he's trying to cut down what he says. He wants this to flower out in your heart. See, this is what God does when he gives his word. He gives it in a concise way, like a seed, and then as you take it in, it blossoms out, and he adapts it to your, to your situation. Look at briefly at the background of this event. This occurred the day after Jesus healed the centurion's servant. So the day after, and it was the day after he healed the centurion's servant, you remember, and said that he'd not seen faith like this in all Israel. <clears throat> Jesus is seen here, not just as a worker, but he's seen as being consistent. Mm -hmm. Wherever he goes, he goes about doing good. He's seen as very alert. He sees something that most of the people probably would have just overlooked it. Funerals were not unusual in those days, and they just kind of 
pulled off to the side of the road and let it pass by, you know. Not Jesus. This is not the way he is. He is insightful. He knew this woman. This was her only son. See, there wasn't a sign up here that said this is the lady's only son. He had surveyed the situation. He saw it. Like he does yours. Mm -hmm. You don't want to miss this. Mm -hmm. And you see him as very compassionate. This situation uh, touched his heart. <clears throat> now what we have here is an example of Jesus going about doing good. The book of Acts tells us in the 10th chapter in verse 38 that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. So this is going to give you an example of something good mm -hmm. that was done. Now what we're finding here in Jesus, Jesus is living out something that's taught in Scripture. That whatever you do, you do unto the Lord. See, he's actually living this out. You don't have to theorize that. What does it mean to live unto God? I've heard people ask this, perhaps in my young years, ask it myself. What does it mean to live unto the Lord? Or to present your body a living sacrifice? You know, like, what does that entail? Well, Jesus is living it out here. He's actually put it into life. The word of the Lord says this in Colossians 3.17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You're going to see a word and a deed mm -hmm. done here. And it's going to be done unto God. Again, Colossians 3.23 says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. That includes that you're walking into a city. Heartily, alert. Before he even gets in the city, there's a wonderful work to be done. Someone coming out of the city, Jesus going into the city, and who do you suppose is blessed? Again, Scripture says in Romans 14, 8, whether we live or whether we whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord. So Jesus is conducting himself as the Lord's. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether we eat or drink, Whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. Well, see, he's going to do that right here. But he's, he's going to do that this instance. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So this is Jesus living unto God here in this, this marvelous text. Now, this is the only time in all the Bible where this city is mentioned. The city of Nain. It was in Galilee, still is in Galilee. This city still actually exists today. It's about two miles from Mount Tabor. That was a place where Sisera de was defeated by Deborah and Barak. Mm -hmm. It's about 14 miles from Indor, where King Saul went and contacted a witch. Mm -hmm. So just tell us about what I'm saying is that there's been, there's been divine activity in this area before, but never quite like this. <laughs> there had never been quite activity like this. The Lord can work in the same area has been worked in before and superseded. Do something grander on a more grand scale. Well, let's see what happened to this uh, circumstances here. On the surface, it looks very average. Jesus going into a city. I mean, how much more, how much more mundane can you get than that? But then you find it. This day didn't end up like an ordinary day, even though it started out that way. Just Jesus went into the city, called name. See, his presence is the point. Yep. <clears throat> Wherever Jesus comes, it changes the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And once you realize when he said, "Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them," this this alters the whole situation. Now things are completely different. Now a funeral procession is transformed when Jesus is there. If Jesus isn't there, it's just, it's just a funeral procession. That's all it is with a lot of sadness and weeping. But when Jesus shows up, it's different. Well, that's so of every circumstance. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You can see it. It's true of every circumstance. If Jesus can come into your circumstance, and that's largely dependent upon your faith and your awareness, mm -hmm. if he can come in, the circumstance changes. The potential is new. It's different. Put it in different circumstances, all in his presence. 
You notice when he came, his disciples were with him. Well, that transformed the situation too when you have a bunch of disciples. That, that changes the situation too. In fact, most of Christ's miracles were done in the, with his disciples around him. At least some representation of them. And then there's the... Uh, <coughs> Much people were with him. So these are like witnesses. Like he's taking along this, these witnesses to behold his great working. <clears throat> now as he comes nigh the gate, <clears throat> he that is life confronts death. Head on. <laughs> Here it is. Here's someone dead coming out. Here's the life of God coming in. I say, you almost know what's about to happen in a situation like that. See, if you could just see this in the midst of your uh, difficulties, sometimes life is, is like a funeral procession. It kind of is like that. You just kind of carry the dead and you're weighed down, you're weeping and you're sad. But if you could just confront Jesus, it will just change the, the whole situation. So life confronts death. And it was a very hopeful situation. It was, uh, this, is the, this is the woman's only son. This is her only son. And... Uh, it's, it, from the text, it sort of reads like he was he was rather young because it said he delivered the, him back to his mother. So he may have been rather a young boy. So uh, hope had died here. Yeah. So far as so far as potential in the world was concerned, there wasn't any hope here. The only son dead. Yeah. Maybe she is a woman with a debt, like that widow that had uh, had a, her sons were going to be sold. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was a woman in debt. We don't know, but this is just a hopeless kind of situation. You could have had called to all kind of consultants in, and you yeah. <laughs> couldn't have done any good there. Not in this case here. And there was there was no other helper. She's a widow. That's right. This is her only son, so she, she had some friends there, but about, about the best they could do is weep mm -hmm. and mourn. No other helpers. You got death. Woman left alone. Widow, but see, that's all confronting Jesus. Jesus is going to confront this. Mm -hmm. He's going to transform this situation. And it says, much people of the city were with her. So you got Jesus coming with a bunch of people in, mm -hmm. and a woman coming with a bunch of people out. Yeah. And you're going to see which group is going to overshadow <laughs> the other group. Huh? Yeah. This is, in a sense, of what the church is like. The church is like a lot of people coming in. And the world's like a lot of people coming out. Mm -hmm. And they, when you confront, see, mm -hmm. something can happen there. Yeah. Now something else to note here about this incident. Nobody asked Jesus to come there, so far as we know. Mm -hmm. I just had a case where a centurion sent servants to Jesus, sent his friends to Jesus when he got close to the house. So there was a case where someone was seeking him. We had other instances where someone came to the synagogue and other people pressed into the house to see him, and the people asked him to do something, but no, there wasn't anything like that here. No beseeching, no asking. Nobody came to Jesus. As far as we know, no one is expecting him. Well, this event had actually been timed in heaven. See, this is an example of something that God's orchestrating from the heavens. Because Jesus was actually doing the work of God. You want to live your life, uh, brothers and sisters, you want to live your life so that you can be ready to confront an unexpected Jesus. Amen. Sometimes all of a sudden your conscience is alive with the presence of the Lord. You can't really account for it to anyone other than someone who knows the Lord. You can't explain this to anybody else. But suddenly you're aware. Christ is there. <clears throat> Jesus said this in John 5, 19, I'm establishing he was doing the works of God, that this event was orchestrated in heaven, and that you have no idea what events concerning you have been orchestrated in heaven. You have no idea what's on the tablets in heaven for you. But when it comes to pass, Jesus will come into the situation. Here's what Jesus said in John 5, 19, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do... What things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So Jesus coming in, he sees what God's going to do here. Mm -hmm. Here's a widow, left alone, funeral, people coming out, a lot of weeping. 
God's going to work. So he, he didn't like make this happen. He fulfilled what God had appointed yeah. to happen. John 5.36 said, I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father had given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father sent me. So this is going to confirm that God had in fact sent Jesus even to the city of Nain. Mm -hmm. And I get the idea it wasn't like a prominent city. It comes, the text comes across that you wouldn't expect Jesus to visit Nain. You might expect him in Jerusalem or Galilee. They were mentioned back in the prophets. But Nain... He can show up in those places. Sometimes you sense that where you live is kind of spiritually desolate. Maybe you've lived in a place like that. And you, you're just not likely that much is going to happen there, it appears. But see, Jesus can show up at Nain. <laughs> he can do it. John 10, 25, Jesus said, Again, I told you, and you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. They, they tell about me what I do tells about me just like what you do tells about you. Mm -hmm. Again, John 10, 32, Jesus said, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. Mm -hmm. So here's another one we're going to see. Shown to us from the Father. Well, <clears throat> what did Jesus do? First thing it says, he, he saw her. Now, it said a lot of people was around her. I don't imagine she was up in the front and very visible, but he saw her. Didn't say he saw the casket. Didn't say he saw the people. He saw her. Mm -hmm. That's what he saw. Right through all of this. Now, he's living this out, what the Scripture says about the Lord. Psalm 11.4 says, His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. So, Jesus is scanning... From a high vantage point, he said, who is my father going to work with today? I know I came to Nain here for a purpose. I'm, ah, there she is. There's the one. Well, that's when the thought occurs to you that you might be that person. <laughs> There's a little something for your soul. Again, Psalm 66, 7 says, his, eye, his eyes behold the nations. He sees penetrating vision. Not just he's up like in an airplane and sees him. It's not mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. He sees the circumstance. He sees how the Father's orchestrated the things. He sees what can be done to glorify God. Mm -hmm. He sees it. And of course, uh, Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So he, he saw her. He saw her. See, if you, if you want to be blessed by God, he's got to see you. <laughs> More than just see everybody see. Can't, can't, he's got to focus on you, in other words. See, he, he focused on her. And was from one point of view, she was, the, she was the person of the day, from one point of view. That's why the psalmist would say, Behold me. Look upon me. That's why he said, he said, Look upon me. See, he knew that if you can ever get God's attention, you'll get God's mercy. Right. Unless, of course, you're a reprobate, and then, yeah. uh, then you don't want God to see you then. And what did he do when he saw her? He had compassion on her. Yeah. Ah, Jesus had never been a widow. Jesus never had a son, let alone a son that died. You see, compassion doesn't mean you've been in the same place the other person's been in. That's not what compassion means. He had compassion on her. Jesus was noted for this. Sometimes the disciples, before Jesus was enthroned, they were not always noted for compassion. Sometimes they'd pay, shh, stop, stop calling on the Master. Bartimaeus, just keep tone it down. Well, they might say, send that woman away. Keeps calling after us and wanted to bless her daughter. So they didn't always have compassion. One time when a host of Samaritans came out, James and John said, would you like us to call fire down on them? <laughs> See, so they don't always know it for compassion, but Jesus was consistent. He had compassion on her. What does that mean? That means he's going to do something about this. Mm -hmm. See, you might have compassion, but it's really, you can't really do a lot about it. But Jesus does something about it, the compassion. One time in Matthew 15, 32, it says of him, Jesus said, I have compassion on the multitude. They've been with me now three days. 
and have nothing to eat. Well, that was a rare occasion. Some people couldn't handle three hours. How about three days? Hmm? I have compassion in the multitude. Again, Matthew 20, 34. So Jesus had compassion on them. Touched their eyes and healed them, some blind men. See, the compassion is a prelude to the work. Yes. You just don't want Jesus to feel sorry for you. Right. We can feel sorry for you, if that's all you want, to some measure. <laughs> but when Jesus has compassion, he does something about the situation. He is compassionate. One of his uh, one of his traits. He is moved with sympathy and pity. And in, in, in the words of Scripture, bowels that yearn. He was touched with this situation. And what did he say to her? <laughs> don't 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 cry. Weep not. Weep not. It's like saying, "Be not afraid." Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorrow not. I can't help but, uh, I, I, I'm persuaded that this woman, is sort of a power came that those words had to be arresting to her when she said, don't, don't weep. Mm -hmm. Stop this pining away. <clears throat> Scripture speak about people pining away. It's a hopeless kind of a, kind of a weeping. So I would say that Jesus, first of all, when he's going to work, he, he gets you disconnected from your grief. Don't, don't, don't weep. <clears throat> Let's be thinking now about what I what I can do here, what I'm going to do. Weep, not. Remember when he confronted uh, Jairus's daughter, he told the people, "Weep not, she's not dead." Mm -hmm. you know, they laughed at him. But yeah. That was at the beginning of the day. They didn't at the last. Right. And Luke 23:28, Jesus is on the way to the to be crucified. The daughters of Jerusalem are weeping, weeping. He says. Weep not for me. Weep not. There's time when weeping is uh, out of order. Weep not. And then he came near to the procession. I get the picture. He sort of walked into the center of it. And it says he touched, he touched the beer or the casket or the coffin. He, he touched it. That's all, that's all it says. He touched it. But this is going to change everything. Mm -hmm. In fact, as soon as he touched it, the people stopped carrying it. That'd be like that'd be like you'd be confronting a funeral procession going down seventh here, and you jumped out of your car and you touched the funeral car, and everybody stopped. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. It all stopped. Procession stopped abruptly. He touched it. You ever think of the? Things that changed, Jesus touched them. Mm -hmm. Matthew 8, 19. Peter's mother-in-law says, He touched her hand, and the fever left her. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you here that when Jesus, this again is a prelude, that Jesus is, I'm going, to be, I'm, going to, I'm going to focus on this matter now, and this is not going to be the same. After I'm through here, this isn't going to be a funeral procession anymore. Or how about Luke 22, 51? A man that was deaf, he says, he touched, the man that had his ear cut off, Malcolm says, he touched his ear, mm -hmm. and he healed him. Didn't say he picked up his ear. Okay. <laughs> Stuck it back on there. It says he touched his ear, <clears throat> and he healed him. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps you've uh, talked about a man that was dumb, he couldn't talk. It said he, he took him aside to the multitude, and he said he, he touched his tongue and he spoke. I'm showing you that when Jesus comes into contact with a situation, it changes it. Yes. It alters the whole situation. Another man is a leper, says he touched him. Mm -hmm. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. So this, as soon as Jesus puts his hand on your trouble, it's not trouble anymore. Amen. Amen. As soon as he touches your situation, your circumstance, all he has to do is get involved with it. That's all. That's all. Mm -hmm. When he does, it's not the same anymore. The town teaches us how to pray. Did you know some of the mothers brought their infants, the scripture says, to Jesus? You know what they wanted him to do? 
Here's what it says in Luke 18, 15. They brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. <laughs> That's all. Hmm. Well, he touched the beer. It stopped. Remember his disciples are with him. Most people are with him. A lot of people with the woman. So there's a lot of, kind of a large congregation of people here. And Jesus speaks out. He says, young man. I say, I get the idea his hand was on the, on the coffin. Young man, I say to thee, arise. You see, they hadn't said that, that train yard to the empty out. She had to focus it down. Just this young man. Rise. Is he going to break this power with a, of death with a word? All Jesus has to do is speak. That, that's all. Amen. I mean, this creation was spoken into existence. Let yes. there be. See, that's how it came into existence. All Jesus has to do is speak a word. That is it. Mm -hmm. And everything gives in to him when he speaks this kind of word. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears, David would say. <clears throat> if there's a storm in life, all he has to say is peace. That's all he has to say. That's all he has to say. And it's a, it's a great consolation to me. Amen. Amen. There are things that I know all too well <clears throat> that I am utterly powerless to change. You can take a class in changing this circumstance and consult with this person or that, but eventually you come to the point you know if God doesn't do something about this, it, nothing's going to be done. And he doesn't have to like roll up his sleeves and work. This is a, this isn't what Jesus does. He just speaks. Yeah. That's all. One word breaks breaks the power. I love that. Uh, I love that truth. <clears throat> now there was an instant, uh, instant response. Yes. You know Jesus has done it when there's an instant response. Now, unfortunately, men have taught us to get used to gradual responses. And uh, there are times when there are gradual. He began to amend. I mean, there. Are, I understand there are those cases. But there are some cases that you want an instant response. Like if you're Peter and you're sinking in the wave, we don't want to begin to amend the word. Right. You got to, it has to be instant. Huh. And that's about the only way you can raise the dead. It's got to be instant. How else are you going to raise the dead? They gradually? You know? <laughs> this is the only way it can really happen. Mm -hmm. So the dead man sat up. Yeah. See, life has certain signs. It Didn't they say he laid there and blinked his eyes a little bit and somebody saw some movement in the abdominal area or whatever. He sat up. Yeah. See, there's when people are alive, there's signs that they're alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not all. He sat up, he began to speak. Yeah. Dispelling any doubt about that maybe this is rigor mortis or something or some kind of a reaction of the body to death. <laughs> you may, there have been bodies that have kind of moved on the morgue table, but none of them have ever talked. Right. But he sat up and began to speak. My, what a... <laughs> May the Lord bless us with more signs of life. Indications of life. People sitting up and speaking, so to speak. <clears throat> and Jesus uh, delivered him to his mother. Wow, what a glad day that was. Yeah. Now, they, now, they didn't go on to the cemetery from there, let me tell you. They went back in. It was rejoicing. It was going back. It was a lot more pleasant than coming out. It was like Abraham and Isaac coming down the mountain. It was a whole lot different going up to the mountain. What a glad day this was for her. And how this, uh, how this affected the people is of interest to me. Great fear came on them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have no doubt observed that we are living in a society when the fear of God is almost absent altogether. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will tell you why this is the case. It's because God's not a working He's, he's largely withdrawn from this generation. Mm -hmm. That's why it's this way. Mm -hmm. You'll find that whenever Jesus worked or God <laughs> worked, it kind of struck fear into people. They, were, they sensed they were in, they had confronted something that was beyond yeah. the domain of nature. Even in, the, even in this world, you confront something you never confronted before, there's something frightening, mm -hmm. frightening about it. Great fear came on them all. Now the Word of God has considerable to say about this. 
Psalm 14:5 says, "There, there were, there were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. For God is in the generation of the righteous, and what happens? It produces fear. It is possible for the righteous to be so dominant that the ungodly are afraid to do something wrong. Yeah. That is possible. Mm -hmm. That God hates in the day that would be more prominent." Mark 4.41 said they feared exceedingly. This is disciples. They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I must admit I have this longing in my heart for God to work in our generation in such a fashion that people fear, great fear. And it like brings a great sobriety and a great turning away from things that distract Again, in Luke 8, 37, after Jesus had healed this man with the, uh, it had to be chained up, and they broke the chains. <laughs> the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went into the ship and returned back again. So what was, uh, what was a blessing to that man that had the demons? <laughs> That man is formerly chained. He didn't ask Jesus to leave. He wasn't afraid. It was the other people were afraid. Again, on the Mount of Transfiguration, I'm showing you here that the more God is revealed, the more this type of fears surfaces. We're living in a time when religion is just too familiar. It's just, it's just too, too familiar. It's, which means it's of the earth. <laughs> That's what it means. It's kind of the, it's not the sort of thing that's, that rattles you at all. Right. What goes on most of the time in the name of the Lord. It doesn't really get your attention. There are the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember, and a cloud descends, and Jesus speaks out of it, and God speaks out of it and says, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Here's what Luke says about that occasion. When he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. Yeah. Why? Because it was so contrary to flesh. It was mm -hmm. so, so contrary. Right. This is one of the great uh, deliverances going to happen when the resurrection and when we're forever with the Lord. This kind of fear is, is not going to be there because we'll have no part of our natures that the, that the divine nature chafes against. See, right now, there's a part of us that God that God's abrasive to. Mm -hmm. But we'll be done with that, praise, praise the Lord, in the world. To come. Until then, we read about things like this great fear. Mm -hmm. Acts 5 5, Ananias, God struck him dead during the church service. Yes. And it says that great fear came on all them that heard these things. A little later in the day, his wife came in. God killed her too mm -hmm. in the church. And again, it says great fear came upon all the church, and about as many as heard these things. I've often thanked the Lord that uh, this is, wasn't a consistent practice that God struck dead all liars. Boy, that thin out a lot. That thin out the ranks, let me tell you. Yeah. Well, it's good to be aff affected by the record of these things. Yes. What I'm showing you here is that when God works, there's a, there's a fear that follows because it's so transcendent to that the things of the world, it's so abnormal for flesh, it in a sense, it's sort of frightening from a human point of view. Great fear came upon them all. Now, what did they do? Well, they glorified God. Amen. I'm going to tell you how they did it. They didn't, they didn't suddenly break out singing a, singing a chorus. <laughs> What's that sort of thing? They glorified God, but he's going to tell you how, how they did it. First thing he said was, the great prophet has risen among us. Uh -huh. now, he hadn't said anything. He wasn't preaching to these people. Uh -huh. huh? Why didn't they say, a great miracle worker has risen? Why didn't they say that? Why did they say a prophet? Interesting to me. A great prophet. Somebody with a word. Uh -huh. <laughs> they didn't say, quick, get out there and bring all the dead bodies out here. Quick, everybody had anyone died recently. Let's get them out here. You've got to see how this affected them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
There's a prophet, a great prophet is risen among us. He's not, not a miracle worker, but a prophet. And I want to show how that this was a fairly consistent response about Jesus. That even when he'd work or work, they'd say he was a prophet. <laughs> it's interesting. Matthew, it seemed to sense that the message, what he said, was of paramount importance. Yes. What he said. Matthew 21, 46. When they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Mm -hmm. hmm. Prophets didn't necessarily work miracles. Mark 6, 15. Others said that he was Elias, and others said it is a prophet. Or one of the prophets. See, they knew. That when God sends somebody, it's not somebody necessarily to do something, but it's somebody to say something. Yes, amen. That what man needs is a word from God. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was preeminently a prophet. Yeah. But he worked these works so you'd listen to what he said. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what he said. A prophet is risen among us. Man, uh, Luke 24, 19. Cleopas and his friend walking along the road to Emmaus. Jesus joins them and they tell him about things that have been happening. He said, what things? What things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed in word. Or John 4, 19. Jesus talks to this woman at the well of Samaria. He says, bring your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you said the truth. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and you've been living with someone that's not your husband. She says, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. <gasps> Didn't notice what these people concluded. John 9, 17, Jesus healed a blind man. Didn't preach him a sermon. He healed him. <clears throat> the blind man said, what, they said of the blind man, what sayest thou of him, and he that opened thy eyes? Well, what, what's he going to say? He said, he is a prophet. Interesting observation, is it not? He is a prophet. And really all the man knew is he, he opened his eyes. And he didn't even know it was Jesus. We find later he, he didn't know he was the Son of God. Now the point I'm making here is that real, real miracles draw attention to what Jesus says. Mm. Amen. A prophet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he is a prophet. Here's something else. I said they glorified God. That glorified God. He is a prophet. Here's something else they said. They said, God has visited his people. Yeah. That glorified God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Visited his people? <coughs> What's that mean? He's injected himself into their affairs. Mm -hmm. He wasn't necessarily invited. He just visited. He just... I want to show you how that this is talked about quite frequently in Scripture. God visiting his people. Not just to see how things are going. <laughs> it's not like you get visited the Tower of Babel. Let's go down and see if it's what's going on there. It's not that kind of visit. Different kind of visit. Psalm 8, 4. Psalm said, What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Mm -hmm. That he comes to do something. Mm -hmm. He's coming to do something. Coming to reveal something. Coming to show something. Coming to bring some advantage. Psalm 65, 9, he looks at nature and he sees the watering effect and its effect how it makes things grow and he says, well, thou visitest the earth and waterest it. See, so, <laughs> see, visiting is associated with bringing a blessing. Again, Luke 1, 68, the prophecy of John the Baptist's father, Zacharias. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. Luke 1, 78. Through his tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited, visited us. Hmm, it's condescending to have the Lord of glory visit, come to where you are. Jesus visited Nain that day. He visited Nain. Some of God's people were there and they saw it. Yes. God's visited us. God visited his people. So some sometime if we have a great blessing that this happens, this will be in order to say God has visited us. He's yes. visited us yes. and strengthened us. Great sign of divine uh, divine blessing. Jesus denounced Jerusalem because they were visited and they didn't know it. 
Here's what he said. <coughs> Your enemies will lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because, because, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for God to send a great word, a great message, a great messenger, a great benefit to someone and they not know it? Yes, indeed it is. But they will be cursed because they didn't. Just as surely as Jerusalem was. These people knew it. See, they said, we've been visited. God visited us. See, a prophet's arisen. See, they knew it. I have this inward fear of, uh, of not recognizing God when he's present. I do not want that to happen. But I know that it, it, such a thing is happen, can happen. Now, as a result of this, and we, I've, I've, I've sought to make a point of this throughout these messages, largely because it's a relatively fresh thought to myself, that if Jesus will in fact work, word will get out. Yeah. That is the truth. And so it happened here. He, he made himself known, and news of Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding regions. Yeah. Yes. Now you, you trace through the book of Acts or trace through the Gospels and this happened almost every time this happened. Whenever Jesus worked, word went out. When, when Peter talked about the wonderful works of God, word went out. That's something that happens when God works. So the issue really is that the people know, that's really not the issue, it's has God worked? <laughs> Word will get out. Let me confirm this with the word of Scripture. Psalm 78, 4 says, states, We will not hide them from their children. That's the works of God. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. Now, under the law, I had to tell the people to do this. You tell your children what I did. Tell them what I did. Stack these stones up. And when they ask what these stones are about, tell them how you, what I did and how you crossed over Jordan. To, you want to have something for the next generation to tell. Yes. You whether there's some church people that don't have anything to tell. <coughs> I've talked to some recently too. And they have lamented. Older, older good, good people of God. But said, but they can't think of anything of any magnitude that that happened in their generation mm -hmm. they had maybe they read a book of the uh, of a revival breaking out in wales there was a welsh revival and all that. maybe maybe if you belong to a certain brotherhood they can tell you back at the cane ridge revival mm -hmm. back there something happened and they've even got it got the site in kentucky isolated off so you can see it because something really big happened there People go to the Holy Land and they will see places that something happened there and it blesses you to be there. Well, it's God's intention that every generation have something to pass on, some great work of God. Yes. It's passed on. God did something. Yeah. See? You don't want to be content with a religion that just basks in history yeah. and doesn't have anything to pass on and contribute to the next generation. Psalm 145, 11 says, this is a token of what? Of the new covenant. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. Amen. Why? Because they experienced it. Mm -hmm. That's why. It happened in their generation. Mm -hmm. And the day of Pentecost, the people were talking among themselves. <laughs> among them were Cretes and Arabians and about 16 other nations. They said, we do all hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Well, Peter wasn't given a dialogue about David killing Goliath, was he? No. He wasn't talking about Israel crossing the Red Sea. That wasn't the theme. That was the wonderful works. He wasn't talking about jail nailing Sisera's head to the floor or about a fire coming down when Elijah was on the Mount of Carmel. 
and about him slaying the prophets of Baal. He was talking about something that happened that weekend. Yeah. That's what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. A Christ had been exalted up into the glory mm -hmm. and had taken away the sin of the world and had conquered death. See, it was a contemporary report. Amen. Those are the reports that can uh, you can pass from generation to generation and and add to the end of the arsenal. Well, what do we see in this miracle? We see a miracle that it wasn't prompted by prayer. Here's an example of Jesus just visited and did it. In the back of your mind, you've got to believe that he can still do this. You've got to believe that as you walk by faith, he can still visit your circumstance and just resolve it. With, maybe you didn't even ask about it. But it happened. Here's an example where there wasn't a supplication, no beseechment, no seeking. He answered before they called. Of course, the prophet said they would. I, before you call, I'll answer. And I was found of them that sought me not. Is that not written? Yeah, amen. Both Hosea and both Romans, I was found of them that sought me not. And here's an example of a widow that found him. And a dead son that found him, and they didn't seek him. Well, uh -huh. yeah. he's still that way, bless the Lord. Amen. It was strictly owing to the compassion of Christ that this happened. <laughs> he was touched. And Jesus is the kind of Savior that when he's touched, he can do something about it. And I commend that, this miracle to you to contemplate. It's a bit different than some of the some of the things Jesus did, but it's good to think about it because something different can happen in your life, and when it does, it doesn't mean it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. Jesus uh, may still be, as you're walking out in despair, Jesus may very well be coming in. Yeah. <laughs>